Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. And welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits. And I was pondering the other day that if there had been just one very small spelling error in the typesetting of the sheet music to Oklahoma, we might now all be singing Rogers and Hammerstein's famous song, People Will Say We're in Hove. Well, I think it's fair to say that fame is a fickle thing and disappears very quickly in many cases, although not in others. And that is something that fascinates me. For example, in the 1930s, the biggest paid film star in 1937 was an actress in musicals, British musicals, and her name was Gracie Fields. Now, Gracie Fields is remembered by people my age and over but really has not been remembered at all in the public consciousness here in the United Kingdom, and even less elsewhere. And yet she and George Formby were two of the biggest stars of British musical films in the 1930s. As I say, she was the highest paid star in the world in 1937. And yet, of the two of them, George Formby is probably considerably better remembered than Gracie Fields. So let's turn our focus to America, the home of Hollywood, the home of the film musical in many ways, certainly in the 1930s. Well, if I were to ask you who is the most famous film actress from musicals in the 1930s, chances are you'll give me an answer of Ginger Rogers. And indeed, I think I'd agree with you. It was, after all, only a few weeks ago here on Musical Talk that we were talking about Ginger Rogers and her amazing 1930s film career in musicals, and particularly how that was only a small part of her wider, lifelong career in films. And yet, one of the biggest names of 1930s film musicals in America was a Canadian woman by the name of Deanna Durbin. And Deanna Durbin is someone who is now almost completely forgotten. If Gracie Fields is remembered only vaguely by people over 50 and more warmly by people over 70, then Deanna Durbin is now more or less remembered by people over 80 or 90. She has almost completely been forgotten. And yet she was a worldwide star in the 1930s and early 1940s. And as you'll learn in today's episode of Musical Talk, her career ran, at least for a while, in parallel with Judy Garland and was considered much more successful. And yet Judy Garland is still a legendary name today and Deanna Durbin is almost entirely forgotten. So whilst those facts are undeniable, I think we can do a little part here on Musical Talk to try and remind people of Deanna Durbin and her importance in the history of film musicals, particularly in the 1930s. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Melanie Gall, who is Deanna Durbin's principal biographer. In fact, her new biography of Deanna Durbin has just been published and is well worth a read. But not only that, Melanie is also a singer and a show writer. And so I also had the pleasure at last year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe of seeing her one-woman show called Ingenue. Deanna Durbin and Judy Garland and the Golden Age of Hollywood. It was a great show and it was a great pleasure to sit down with Melanie afterwards to talk about that one person show, but also about the career of Deanna Durbin. And we also found out some interesting things about Melanie herself. So if you want to find out about the history of songs associated with knitting, stick around for this interview as well. Deanna Durbin, 1930s musicals and the history of knitting songs. Well, what other show's going to give you that? I think we all know the answer. Well, I think that's enough teasers for the episode. Let's get down and listen to that interview itself. I do hope you'll enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with the lovely Melanie Gall. Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. (music) 
Hello, my name is Melanie Gall, and I created and I perform in the show Ingenue, Diana Durbin, Judy Garland, and the Golden Age of Hollywood. Now, Melanie, I saw this show here in Edinburgh, and I loved it immediately. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I really enjoyed your performance of it, because you're telling the story, for the most part, of Diana Durbin, but there are lots of Judy Garland flavours. It's also telling the story of, if you like, the golden age of Hollywood musicals, certainly the 30s and 40s. It takes us through into the war, and it also tells us the story of Diana Durbin beyond that. Now, the interesting thing for me is, of course, that you're quite the expert on Deanna Durbin in the sense you are the author of her biography, which has just been published as well. And that's quite an interesting insight, it seems to me, when trying to tell the story also in another medium. So you've told the story of her life in a book, but you're also telling it in, you know, what might be called a... a, a, a I'm going to call it a musical bio... A bi- biographical cabaret, I suppose. It is, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Do you find the two different mediums that you've told the story... You know, how does that reflect each other? Well, the musical came first. So the musical I started, I wrote in 2019 and I started touring in 2019. And I had, I had photographed all the research, basically. I had gone into all the museums, all of, there's lots of archives with people who who did research her over the decades and who donated their research. And they're in these old dusty files. So I had basically photographed it all thinking, if I ever have time, I would love to see about doing a book. And then all of a sudden, there was a lot of time. (laughs) There were no performances. There was so much time. So... I I was very happy with the musical until I wrote the book. It's I mean here it's forty eight minutes long. The the proper one really the one I do in theaters is about ninety minutes. Yes. So there's a lot more information. But now that I've researched the book, there's more information. So I say a thing, and it is very hard not to extrapolate upon it because you're just like, well, here it is, but then also this, and then this person said this. So it's it is really hard to trust the script and stick to the script now that I know how much more there is I could say about each thing. But the show here especially, has, it has to be 48 minutes. It can't be any longer in the slot I have. So I, I, I'm, I'm struggling not to keep adding things that I think people would like to hear. Well, I think you've just whetted my appetite by saying mm-hmm. that. It's also quite interesting to me, isn't it? Because as a, a, a one-woman show, mm-hmm. you know, you own the stage. It is your stage, you're, yeah, and you do own the stage, by the way. You're singing immediately as we, uh, you know, at the moment you come on, we in the audience are in and we hear you sing uh, a Carl Porter song, Begin the Beginning, in fact. Mm-hmm. And, then, um, and then we move into the story as you relay it to us. But, of course, you could so easily step outside of your role as actress into your role of biographer. So I, I can see there's a pressure there. What drew you to Deanna Durbin in the first place? And I'm, I'm going to ask you this question more generally and, and pair it with a second question, okay. if I may, which is, of course, very sadly, Deanna Durbin is simply not remembered very much these days. I, I'm not sure what it's like in uh, Canada and America, but certainly in the United Kingdom. She's remembered by a few, and I will, I'm going to set out my stall immediately. My late great-aunt, who only died a couple of years ago, who was into her 90s when she passed away, was always an enormous fan of Deanna Durbin and had said so since the 30s when she was a young woman. Wow. So there is a sidestep. She lived in a place in East London called Barkingside and I happen to notice in your programme you reproduce a letter from a fan who lived in Barkingside. Is so that I, where he lived? Yes, he, he, and she, she lived in a different road to him but, but at the time that Deanna Durbin was making films and that letter's from 1942. So. I can send you the entire letter too. I bought it oh. on eBay. It's actually from eBay and I was like, I want to own this letter so I did, I did buy that letter. Well, well I might take it I might mm-hmm. photocopy and just walk it past the house it came from. Yeah, you actually you should do that. <laughs> Next yeah. time I'm visiting my relatives. Yes. But my aunt spoke about Deanna Durbin, mm-hmm. so Deanna Durbin was known in my family. But when I mentioned I was going to see this show with my friend here in Edinburgh, who wanted to see the show because he was intrigued by it, he didn't know of Deanna Durbin. For him, it was the Judy Garland element he was most aware of. So I suppose, where did your love come from? And why do you think she sort of disappeared in the public consciousness? Okay, I've, I do have an answer for that. Yeah. So in America, in most of Canada, and in pretty much all of America, she has mostly been forgotten. Australia is a little closer to this. So more people remember her. Her movies were played a lot more recently in Australia. And same here in, yes. in Britain. They, they were played, they were released on VHS. I don't know that they were released widely on VHS in America. I mean, they have been re-released on DVD now. But um, so in the 80s... They were, they were available here. They were available in Australia. They weren't available in Canada and the States. So people, there was a whole generation who didn't hear about her. She wanted to be forgotten. She didn't want to be badgered. She didn't want a big resurgence of her movies because for her, the attendant spotlight would fall right back on her. And yeah. she had 
worked so hard to build the life she wanted away from Hollywood. She didn't want to lose that, especially as she got older. She did start writing to her fans again quite late in her life, and she some of them she corresponded with for years. And she did start signing the letters Diana again instead of Edna <laughs> May. So she did sort of take on her movie persona in a more friendly way nearer to the end of her life. But, Which um, was only about 10 years ago. Yeah, she it? died in 2013. So yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty recent. But she's from Winnipeg, Canada, and I sing in Winnipeg every summer at a festival. So, I mean, I knew of her as a child. There is a children's series of books in Canada that mention her. I mean, they're set in the Depression-era Toronto. And oh, these, really? Yeah, they're, they're written by Beatrice Thurman Hunter, and they're about these, these girls and three girls who are friends, and they go see three smart girls, and then they decide which one they each are. So I, I, That's a Deanna Durbin film for our listeners who might yes. not know. Yes, quite. Yeah, so I mean, I knew about them from that book, but then singing in Winnipeg each year, and, and every year I basically pick a historic character and write a different musical about them, oh. and then, so I have a whole bunch at this point, and it's, people want to see different things, so every year I do a different one. I've done Vera Lynn, I've done Edith Piaf, I've done Jacques Brel, so you pick That's a different That's quite person. a range, isn't it? It is, yeah. it is quite the range, it's fun. I've done Sophie Tucker, there's the most recent was Lost Songs from American Prohibition, which was more of an event than... Anyway, so all these things. But so every year I would go there and they'd say, when are you doing Deanna Durbin? Because people mm. do know she... People in Winnipeg know she's from Winnipeg. Her original house is still there. The house she donated in 1940 to for the Kiwanis Club Milk Fund. <laughs> she she basically bought, a, bought land and, and donated the money to buy a house. Her mother actually went there for the sod turning and they auctioned out this house. Goodness. So, Right. So she is very, there's nothing named after her. However, her, her parents' house, the house she was born in, the house, you know, the house she donated, her grandmother's house, they're all still there. So Winnipeg does kind of remember her. The Deanna Durbin house is often on the garden tours. So basically every year people ask, what about her? And I thought, okay, you know, the year I get assigned a giant theater in this festival will be <laughs> the year I do a Deanna Durbin show. Because usually the theaters are like 100 seats or 120. Yes. I got a 350 seater and I'm like, this is it. <laughs> this is the year. And you have a, you have a year after you, you know that to basically put the show together. Yes. So, so that it was always sort of on the list of things to do. And then, then it became the, and I, I hadn't, and I sort of thought, okay, there are a bunch of songs nobody knows. I, I had seen one of her movies. I thought, okay. But then once I started looking at her life and realized, how involved she was in so many things that carry forward today, like the role of the teenager in movies or the fact that Universal would be out of business. All the movies that came out of Universal International would not exist if it weren't for her. She is involved in so many things in movie history and in, in, in history history. So I became fascinated by her. So it's, it's not actually as though you really, you knew of her, but you didn't actually sort of live and dream and think about her all the time in your youth. Um, is she someone you've come to? I mean, almost? I hope my youth isn't totally over. <laughs> <laughs> I meant your um, uh, yes. juvenile youth. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, because of the books, yes, but it was only that one movie. That was the one movie I had seen. I had mm. seen Three Smart Girls. I knew the music from the movie, but... No, I hadn't seen her other films because they just weren't available. You couldn't just go onto eBay and order them. There was no eBay. No, of course, no. You know, it's a very different world, wasn't it? Well, that's the thing. I mean, if, if it wasn't in Blockbuster, yeah. you couldn't rent it. So I, I wasn't able to get her movie. So I knew of her. I knew what she looked like. I did not know that much about her. Well, I must say, apart from the fact my aunt was, my great aunt, I should say, was, uh, was keen, uh, I also didn't know too much about her. But... I did know some of the music, mm -hmm. and actually, uh, I think we should talk about the, 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 your piece, if I may, because oh, sure. you have several songs in there, and I was surprised by how many I knew, so it's foolish, but it's fun. I would call it a light 1930s ditty, really. It is. I mean, it's from Mad About Music, and everybody, she doesn't sing that alone, really. I yeah. mean, everyone's riding their little bikes and singing it together. <laughs> no, that's I Love to Whistle. What movie is that from? I should know this. No, I think that's also from there. It's perfectly possible. Yeah, I mean, it's been... I'm very jet-lagged. <laughs> but no, that I love to whistle they were on bicycles. It's foolish. Someone's going to know. And I'm sorry, I just, I just blanked on this. But, um. but I'll tell you what was interesting to me. I'd heard it on the radio here in the United Kingdom. Really? Yes, because up until recently, we had several slightly elderly DJs on the BBC Radio 2, which was the kind of station that was going to play that. And we had David Jacobs and we had Desmond Carrington. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that Desmond Carrington played Deanna Durbin songs, and I knew that from there. Oh, so lovely. as late as... Well, he died in the... He literally died about five years ago. So I would say certainly in the last ten or so years, Deanna Durbin has been played on the radio well, here. good. Yes, and there's always good. been um, a, a, 
I wouldn't say it's widespread, but there's always a group of people who were very keen on the pre-war music. I am one of them. And Me so too. I picked up quite a lot of songs. So I also knew round and round the turntable goes, which I think is a 1940s number. Um, yes, yeah, that, that is... The story behind that is very interesting because in the movie that featured that, they actually made a society of DJs and they flew a bunch of DJs in to do a promotional stunt for the movie because in the movie she plays a, a, a DJ and these DJs realized when they got there that there wasn't a society of DJs, that they were just being flown in to promote a movie and they, oh. they formed their own. So it created... They, cre- they created their own society of DJs from this movie promotion event. So, so fact followed fiction in a strange fact, way. Exactly, and that, that was around for quite a while. I mean, it's, it's segued into something else now, but yeah, that I think was the National Association of Radio DJs or something, something like that. I will think the one thing I will say about that particular song is it's got quite the hook because I did know it once again Mm -hmm. Desmond Carrington and David Jacobs will have played it and you sang it and it's now two or three days since I saw your show and it keeps lurking in the back of my mind and bearing in mind I I see almost exclusively musicals up here that's quite interesting to me but it has such staying power. Well, I mean, well, thank you. I mean, that's a compliment, I think. It is. Oh, it did, I definitely. I am your is. earworm. <laughs> well, so. yes, I mean, that's exactly right. But it, what it also goes to show is, I think, the quality of the songs that she was singing. Yes. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, sadly, that I suspect with her eclipsing her own popularity, if you like, you know, removing herself from the public scene, being, if you like, the, uh, the, <laughs> the musical Greta Garbo. Right. Some of her music has got, has got lost with her. Because her records haven't lived on in the same way that her reputation hasn't lived on. Whereas, for example, Judy Garland, you know, her songs and her back catalogue are always being performed and mined, including some of the more minor songs, just because there's still a kind of sort of light burning in that legacy, if that makes sense. Right. And it's interesting, you know, that is a very good point. And another point is a lot of these songs weren't covered by a lot of other people. I mean, they are, a lot of them are American songbooks, essentially what would have been standards if, if more people oh, had sung them. But more people didn't sing them. This is the thing. And... I mean, for example, one song, and it's not in my show, it's a song More and More, and people do sing that quite a lot, but she made it so famous at one point that Frank Sinatra wrote her a letter and said, I was going to sing it, I'm not singing it now, because people want to hear less and less of me and more and more of you. No, nice line. Yeah, but, no, I was yeah, like, yeah. that's lovely. But this is why, like, the, the major singer, I mean, he did end up singing it, yeah. but, but still, you know, the, the people who kept the American songbook songs going often didn't sing her songs. Now, that is, I mean, that's really interesting. And is that because she was such a personality singer, would you say? Because there are some people who sing songs and other people don't cover them exactly as you right. said uh, I'm trying to think why that would be because you know uh, one of the songs you do sing in your show is uh, um, from the Wizard of Oz you know Somewhere right. Over the Rainbow of course and that's been covered a million times even though obviously the Judy Garland one is going to be the one that lives forever like Bing Crosby and White, you know, White Christmas you know there are right. certain songs associated with people but, but they escape but was Somewhere Over the Rainbow covered at the time? I don't know that it was. No, I think you might be I mean, this be right. is the thing. So these weren't being covered for the most part. I mean, Vera Lynn sang, she sang Say a Prayer for the Boys over there. So that would, but yeah. I mean, again, that was Britain. Yeah, that would have, that would have played with uh, yeah, our, our uh, hit parade, as it were. Well, so. exactly. But, but Vera Lynn was just, she was equally as famous at that point, you know, but, but, oh, yeah. but here. So, uh, but for the most part, I mean, if there was, if no one would be able to compare yeah. they weren't going to be singing those songs and if these songs are forgotten they never would have been covered later like Somewhere Over the Rainbow was so many times that's it I mean it's, it's genuinely interesting because I'm also wondering if there's a gender thing going on because actually when I think back to the great American songbook it's quite often songs which were introduced by Fred Astaire or right. Bing Crosby and I just wonder uh, and, you know Fred Astaire's marvellous and I love Fred Astaire but his, so do I. But his voice is what you would call uh, a very affable voice that's a good way to put it. He was very affable. But you can also imagine how that song could then be sung by somebody else. Whereas if Deanna Durbin has this sort of character and a reputation and, and a position, also she's thought of as being a singer, whereas Fred Astaire is a singer. I think of him as a singer, but most people think of him as a dancer, of course. So I wonder True. if it's also... Some of the, I, think it, I wonder if songs escape more easily from some performers than others. Also, she was, she was very young when she sang some of these. So, I yeah. mean, if you're, in, say, an adult male singing with a big band, are you going to cover the song that a 13-year-old made famous? I mean, just... You don't want to be yeah. compared unfavorably to a child. Teeny but. bopper. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So well, there is something in that, of course. Yeah. Because she, she, as you, and you've alluded on this already, because she, uh, you know, she is instrumental in creating what might be called the first phase of teen culture. Oh, for sure. You know, we think of Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, and of course they were all contemporaries and they knew each other, as you quite rightly explain in in your show. But she was right there and would be remembered as such if she hadn't uh, sort of gone into retirement, as it were. Exactly. But even the, the series of Mickey Rooney movies, I mean, those were made after she, after Deanna became famous. I mean, just a couple yeah. of years, but she established the teenage superstar. 
And then, I mean, Mickey Rooney was under contract to MGM at the time. He was. But they weren't starring him in things. And then all of a sudden he made the Andy Hardy series. But again, she had already established the role of a teenage protagonist Isn't at that, that point. interesting? And that was in the 30s? That was 1936. Isn't that interesting? And same with Jackie Cooper. I mean, he, he was acting, but he wasn't the teenage protagonist. He was in her fourth movie, I believe. Oh, right, okay. With her. And, and then he but went But she on. was there first. That's the point. She was... Yeah. She, they were maybe there first, but she established the fact that a teenager could, could basically hold a movie. This, that certain age. That was the movie he was in with her. Good, well, good name under the circumstances, it's, isn't it? Well, exactly. Because I'm also thinking, I mean, um, the Archie comics, for example, are not that popular here in the United Kingdom, but I know they came into being in 1942, which is only, say, five or six years after this phase of filmmaking. So I it's did very not much, know the date, but very, that makes sense. Very much a response to that. Well, um, he was originally envisaged as being the cartoon version of Andy, um, Andy Hardy. I didn't know that. Yeah, so I mean, if you think about it, it's the same, very it's the same idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... We've established Diana Durbin, and I'm sure we'll get back to her, but let's talk about your version of her songs and, 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 your, and your piece. So you decided you were going to do it, and you've, you've got experience of doing these shows with uh, famous singers, male and female, I noticed. But, um, so how do you put them together? You know, it, it, that piece of blank paper, that most threatening of things in right. any creative world, how do, you, how do you attack it? I mean, you start with the songs. So basically, I pick the songs I like. I picked the songs that have to be in the show. Like yeah. Over the Rainbow, had to, it had to be in there. It's a Judy Garland song. It, people expect it. So that, you, know, you pick the songs that have to be in. You pick the songs you want to be in. And then you sort of look thematically. When were the songs written in the career? What are the songs sort of about? Where could they fit in? And then you sort of work in the important parts of their life. And I mean, the first time I did, I have a few actually different Edith Piaf shows. And the first time I did a Piaf show was one of the first shows I ever wrote. I didn't know that much about her life, but I certainly felt I did. So, so you know, I had a couple little highlights. You had the bits. courage of your convictions. Well, this is the <laughs> yes. thing. I mean, the more you know, the, the, the less confident yeah. you are in what you know. So, you know, I, I had a few stories that may or may not be true. I don't I mean, it's been, it's been 12 yeah. years now. I don't, I don't, who knows? Research may have moved on. Yeah, you know, something like that. Maybe her past changed. But, um, so I was very confident that I gave a good overview of her life just by saying these very, like, separated by quite a lot of time, tiny stories. And I'm like, there we go, that's her life. But when you actually research someone's life properly, which I have grown to do <laughs> over the years, you think, okay, what can I leave out? And there's very little you feel you can leave out. It's harder and harder, I bet, isn't it? Yes, because you want to do harder. justice to well, the Well, that's person. the thing. Yeah. You're essentially pre- deciding how history is presented. And this might be the only time. And this is a person you've never met. You know, I've never met her. I respect what she does, but also I've never met her. I mean, no. it's someone I will never meet. And I am the one deciding how their history. And same with the book, deciding how their history will be will be preserved and that's kind of a lot of responsibility well you're the ambassador of their legacy in a strange way that's a good way to put it um yes and a lot of people think they know things about these people that aren't necessarily based in fact like i I know some deanna durbin fans who are very secure on certain things that they think are true to the fact that they have publicly challenged me and right okay um, about how she spelled her name as a child because they found one picture with it spelled slightly differently however i found her birth records so i mean it's one of these just like Take your money and yeah, you know, kind you, of. Yeah, you, I mean, right. that's the thing. So, so you can yeah. only. So you're dealing with people who think they know more, and you're dealing with people who don't know anything and want to learn. And so you are, yeah, you are the ambassador of her legacy. That's that's a heady responsibility. Yeah. But you know, it really is, isn't it? It's interesting, and and also you've, in a strange way, a show like the one, particularly the cut down version, but even the longer version, is going to be the digest of their lives oh, anyway. Yeah. So it can only be a little bit point to point. Yeah. Um, you know, so for example, my friend is probably unlikely to encounter Deanna Durbin again, whereas I'm now inclined to go off and want to read your biography. So, um, and I suspect it's the kind of thing that although my late aunt's no longer around, I might buy copies from various members of my family too. So, um, well, you know, as she's mentioned, uh, and the Barking's Eye connection sort right. of helps there. But right. that, but it's, it, it is that, you're right. So the, the show, if you like, has to be a high-level skim, but truthful uh, whilst at the same time being entertaining. Now, that's an interesting choice to have to make. You know, you, you are going to be an editor of a life, um, mm-hmm. and the responsibilities for a show are different from a book. The book has got to be, um, I suppose, more broadly objective. That's a, that suggests a show well, exactly. isn't. But it, but, but, no, I mean, but, a show isn't. You're doing it out of love or hate. I mean, for a yeah. show, I mean, I feel like you can either show someone to be a terrible person, or you, or you especially if you're playing them as a character. Of course, You know, yeah. you can't... I mean, I think she was a wonderful person. I think the decisions she made were far in advance of her time. I mean, 
she she did not let the people take advantage of her at Hollywood. After a point, she had she took her power back. I mean, she did what so few How people. How forward thinking is that? Yeah, well, this quite. is the thing. I mean, it was. I think she did some amazing things. Um, there's a lot to tell about her life, you know. And you can't get it all in, whether no. it be the 90 minute version or the let's call it the hour version, the 48 minute version. Exactly. Um, so editing, it's a hard choice. Editing is a hard choice. Editing the book was easier because I wrote the book. It was about double the length it is now. <laughs> and, the ed- and the publishers double were like, Durbin. cut it down. Yeah. It was like, cut it down. There's too much Canada in there. <laughs> I was like, ouch. Oh. Okay. So I took out a lot of the Canadian references. I mean, there's still a lot in there because she is from Canada. Yeah, I was going to, you can't absolutely brush that out. Quite. No, especially since the one reporter in the world who had sort of unfettered um, access to facts about her lived in Winnipeg. He knew her grandmother. So he would go to her grandma, to Sophia, her name was Sophia. He would go to Sophia's house and be like, what's going on with Diana? And Sophia would tell him. And everyone else got these things coming out of Hollywood. They, Which would be ca- carefully censured and controlled. Very they? carefully. Yes, quite, yes. Particularly in that era. Well, I would say particularly in that era. It's the same now. But it's a, it was a studio system then, wasn't it? So it was, it was very... Very. Um, parental almost, and certainly um, patrician. Very patrician. And also, yeah, they, they made a character from the name to the look to what they like to eat, and all of that was put out as fact. <laughs> yes, I mean, a lot of that history has been revealed for a lot of the people from that period, all the, uh, you know, the double dating. And, and indeed, mm-hmm. you touch upon this actually very nicely in the show. You don't um, overdo it, but you certainly let it be known that, you know, she's living her own life, but there's mm-hmm. a spin being put out. And a great deal of control being put on her life, but she's also responding to that by trying to carve her own way. You can see, I think, the independent woman in her, even within the stifling, I have to say, strangulation of of the Hollywood studio system, I think. And what's, I mean, what I find especially interesting about her is that, I mean, there was Hedda Hopper, there was, there were all of the gossip mongers who, their job was to ruin people and sell magazines or sell newspapers. I mean, they were, that's, that's what they were supposed to do. Luella Parsons, too. I mean, this, that was their job was to ruin people's lives. They could have ruined Diana's life so many times. I mean, she did make questionable decisions. You know, she, she had her children. Both of them were six months after each marriage. I yes, mean, which tells you something. Yeah, yeah I mean, quite... right? Uh, you know, it was never quite, you know, according to Orson Welles, she absolutely had an affair with his friend, you know, while they were filming the movie. You know, Joe Cotton, according to Orson oh, Welles. Oh, Joe Cotton, yeah, gosh, right. According to Orson, he's like, in his biography, he wrote that, quote, she was bawling him. <laughs> I mean, that's a right, direct well, that's, quote. Well, that's pretty full on, isn't it? I was it? like, yeah, quite... thanks, Orson, yeah, quite... for that. Um, but, you know, he, I mean, this is, yeah. he had a lot to say about his own life, and yet he still put that in there. So, true or not, there was a lot of gossip out there, and yet, even just her divorces. I mean, women didn't get divorced in that no. time. It, it, I mean, they did, but it would be their fault. And she, it all just rolled off of her. Everyone wanted her to be innocent. They wanted her to be okay. There was a great deal of projection. And, of course, the character or the imagery that she was portraying, this sort of... Uh, pure well I mean the show's called Ingenue you know and and Ingenue has a very specific meaning and a very specific sort of connotation Mm -hmm. you know um it's almost so pure. I mean, I always think, you know, the, the, the ingenue and the soubrette are the two yes. uh, in a musical comedy. And the ingenue very rarely gets a laugh either. She's no. actually quite serious. So, you know, she's, you know, very often the male character will come in, have all the fun with the soubrette, but then run off at the end with the ingenue. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and you always think, well, that's a strange combination. But there we are. That's, uh, that's the way that plots worked at the time. But um, even in relation to Judy Garland, I mean, all the, when they were engaged to their first husband, I mean, Diana got engaged to someone. She met him when she was 15. He was 22. That is a I mean, teen romance. I mean, she was actually <laughs> probably 16 because they lied about her age until they got engaged. And all of a sudden, they're like, oops, we messed up. She's actually a year older. So, I mean, it was, yes. th- that was you know, it was just, it was a reveal and everyone kind of knew. But, yeah. but nevertheless, 15 or 16, she was a lot younger than he was. And, you know, he wasn't in an important position in the studio he was a second assistant director you know he what that wasn't no no that wasn't important his, his dad worked at the studio it was you know yeah. he wasn't he wasn't anywhere near the level of who the world felt she should be with but everyone made it to be fine it became fine you know the 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 reporters turned it into you know he's there to support her career and he's an up-and-coming young executive but when judy became engaged to david rose it all became you know he she ruined his life what about martha Kay? That's interesting. So it was, I mean, these two, they both were in sort of questionable situations, but with Diana, it was like, she's perfect, it's wonderful. For Judy, it's like, well, 
you know, they'll get engaged if he ever bothers to get divorced. I mean, it was just very different ways looking at them. But the media and the press have always had a line that they want to take. And, you know, it's, if the facts don't match, then you you manipulate them. And exactly. it's tr- And it's the same for the studios. The studios had a vested interest in getting a particular story out. And certainly, I think you make it very plain in your piece that MGM were interested much more in Durban than they were in Garland. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if she was... St- in their eyes, more expendable, certainly in this era. Mm-hmm. And that's quite interesting. You know, you know, from the 21st century perspective, that seems insane. But obviously, that's, you know, to, to imagine that... Because there's a mistaken um, firing, isn't there? Or at least letting go. It's, it's um, Yes, yes, there was. There was. Um, what is interesting, though, is that Judy made a lot of money for MGM. If you just make it about oh, yeah. the bottom line, she made them a lot of money, but they still didn't treat her like a star. Whereas from the, the release of her first movie at Universal, Diana was treated like a star. Isn't that interesting? And it never changed. I mean, it changed, okay, it changed when she came back from having her child and yeah. there was a new ownership of the studio and it merged with Universal, with International. So things did change. But for the first Era. decade, I'd yes. say at least a decade of their careers, um, it didn't matter how much money Judy made. It didn't matter how successful her movies were. She was still seen as, as a machine as working lesser, for this. lesser almost, yeah. Exactly. Constantly yeah. lesser. Whereas Diana Durbin was the golden girl, I suppose. She could ask for what she wanted for food. For example, I mean, and again, some of this is media spin, but there was a story about how... um, Actually, no, this was in Pasternak's... um, This was in Pasternak's autobiography. So, I mean, he said that she asked for French fries for breakfast and every day. And he said, you know, if she wanted strawberries flown in from the Swiss Alps, it would have seemed more reasonable. But she wanted fries, she got her French fries. Whereas Judy was only allowed to eat soup that with the, you know, Louis B. Mayer, he sort of changed the recipe of his mother's soup and gave it to her in the commissary just for her. No, so what, it was what, It was such a big difference. What a controlling situation, yes. Right, quite. whereas she wants French fries for breakfast, it becomes, isn't she adorable? Here's yes. some French fries. Um... They also had very different op- uh, styles of voices, don't, uh, don't And once again, you, you do this very nicely as well. You know, Judy is what you would call a little bit more Tim Penale jazz. Yes. And Deanna Durbin is historically operatic. I mean, that's how she's discovered. Yes. Although she doesn't fall in, and, uh, you know, forgive me, and you can tell me I'm wrong here, but there's often a sense that people with operatic voices can't easily transition into what might be called standards in the popular song. Or they can sing them beautifully, but perhaps without the... You know, this is such a generalism, so forgive me. You know, may, maybe without the swing or without the jazz or something. There's some, some tonal difference that you can tell sometimes that an opera singer is singing uh, standard as opposed to a jazz singer. That's, I'm using very broad terms right. here. Um, I don't think that's true with Deanna Durbin. You can hear, tell that she's got this operatic voice and she can sing the opera, but she can actually turn the Tim Pan Alley number um, round. So it, it's, um, so it bounces, at least. A um, couple of them. A couple of them. Yes. But, um, I'm not sure she swings. She quite. doesn't really swing. No. And what's interesting is, um, I mean, it's look. It started when they were at MGM. Both girls were given singing lessons with different teachers. Deanna's teacher reported every week to the Metropolitan Opera to let them know yes. what she did. Judy's didn't actually give her singing lessons. Um, I forget his name. It's in the book. Um, yeah. There's a lot of facts. I forget his name offhand, but it was one of the one of the popular song composers, and he, she just sang through his songs. That was oh, right, okay. that was her lesson. So I mean, it was very different. Um, also, Diana never really did sing, and maybe this is going back. This is why the songs weren't picked up by a lot of other people because they were sung classically for the most part. So you know, Sinatra's not going to be like, "Hey, look at this great classical esque yes. early American songbook song. I'm definitely going to sing that, and it'll work." So maybe, may, I mean, that may answer the question ever so slightly, mm-hmm. doesn't it? That um, that actually, although she she sings beautifully and in a light and jaunty way, it mm-hmm. is not a swinging way, and that is an essential thing. I mean, you know, forgive me, we, this takes us back to Rogers and Hart versus Rogers and Hammerstein, right. isn't it? You know, Rogers and Hart swing and Rogers and Hammerstein don't, which is why the, you're more likely to find Rogers and Hart on a Frank Sinatra album than you will a Rogers and Hammerstein number. Well, exactly. Gosh, I'm, you know, I'm finding this terribly fascinating. Me too. I'm just, <laughs> I, me too. It's just been, I, I've actually, as far as dates and a lot of this information, I've, I've actually been working on another book since this book, so I'm a little panicked. I'm like, okay, try to remember everybody's names, try to remember all these facts, because it has been a few months. I appreciate that, but I also appreciate the fact you've also, you know, you've thought it through. So actually, in right. a way, it doesn't sort of matter if it was 1937 or 1938. It's actually yeah. much more about okay, the, the, general, the general thrust. So this isn't, um, once again, I would direct people to other sources of information once they finish mm-hmm. listening to this episode, right. because they're interested. 
interested about any of these people. But of course, your book is part of that. Um, by the way, what is the book called? I think we probably oh, need to mention Oh, it's called Deanna Durbin, Judy Garland in the Golden Age of Hollywood. Um, Blackwells and Waterstones are not releasing it. It's, it's there for pre-order. They're not releasing it until the 1st of October, although it has been released in North America. But it's, it's on Amazon. You but can pre-order coming, it. It's coming for Christmas. That's it's the coming point. for Christmas. Yeah, it's quite... And I'm, I'm really, honestly, I'm really proud of this book. I've done so much research. And, and again, during the pandemic, I, I didn't know what to do. All the performance stopped. And so I did, like, I wrote the book. I managed to get an agent. I managed to, the agent got a publishing deal. So, I mean, I sort of feel like I got to do this the right way. You have, in a way, that you had a good COVID. Nice. If, if I, I don't want to make light I mean, of it. I wrote it, but, two books. So, yeah, yeah I mean, kind of did. I mean, uh, I lived with my mom for two and a half yeah. years, which was, I was able to be there yeah. for her, which was That's good too. Fun. But, it well, was no, good. But it's no, good. It was good. good family stuff, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. And I have yeah. a pet bird. So, like, I was there my bird and my mom stuck in northern yeah. Canada. And now two books as children. And now, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully the second book will get a book deal out of it, too. And then it will have, it will have been in good COVID, I guess. But um, let's talk more about the songs, then, that sure. you've picked for the, the piece. Um, and the, I suppose, I mean, the interesting thing about Deanna Durbin's sort of film career, if you like, mm-hmm. in terms of her film career and therefore her recording career, which is sort of... Uh, Simultaneous, partly derived from the um, films, but right. also, also she was singing albums of stuff beyond that. Yes, she was. So let's say the 30s and 40s are the easiest way of delineating that. Sure. Um, but they're very different periods in terms of music. You know, Tin Pan Alley changes with the war. You know, mm-hmm. in the, the 30s period, is it's not as jaunty as the 20s, but it's still a very powerful... I mean, this is my favourite period of music. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, George Gershwin and I, I'd mm-hmm. like to say we go way back. I never met him. But, you know, uh, he brings me almost more joy than almost any other sort of musical theatre writer. Um, although Gilbert and Sullivan are following up behind. So oh, I, I, read, I, I read your bio. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I, I'm surprised I, they're not ahead. <laughs> oh, well... It depends on the mood I'm in on a day. Ask right. me tomorrow, and I might, they might have a different billing. But you know, but the point is that um, I love the '30s. The '40s becomes very different. You know, the predominance, I must say, of American music, particularly in Britain, mm-hmm. because you know the the Glenn Miller sound is still true. revered over That's here. That's true. But also, the songs were serving a different function, as uh, and you can hear that I think in the songs. Um, but it, the forties is also a great decade. It just just does feel sort of tonally different, I think, uh, to what comes before, and of course very different again to what comes in the fifties. Whether you're then moving into rock and roll yes. or, or into musical theatre, as it dis- disappears up the Rodgers and Hammerstein alley, let's call it that. But um, did you, as a singer, and when you were making your choices, can you detect the difference between a sort of thirty song and a forty song? And do you have any preferences? Well, okay. First off, I, Deanna didn't really sing Tin Pan Alley songs, so even though they were around in the thirties, at that point they they were billing her as an operatic soprano. And so Interesting. everything she sang, she sang standards. She did sing, I mean, there were original songs there. She, I mean, look, Gus Kahn wrote all sorts yeah. of, of songs, popular songs, and he, she sang that pretty early in her career. Um, but almost everything she sang had a very, it could have been an art song. It could have, it could have been a rollicking art song, but it was not Tin Pan Alley. That's the thing. So the 1940s was when she did try to sing the more popular style of music, and that was, that was when her, her music, she, that's when she got more control over what she was doing. Interesting, also. yeah. Um, and she so, had a dedication, a dedication to supporting the war effort as well. So yes. you know, she she bought into that quite rightly. She had a bomb shelter and she knit. Yeah. So she did lots of things. Um, but also, so another show I do is about the knitting songs from I World gonna, War One. I was going to ask you. So, no, this is this, let's go off on a little wonderful tangent okay. because one, you you have several albums to your name. I do sometimes. I them, do. Well, two. <laughs> I guess them, I always do. Yeah, and two of them relate to um, one's called Sweeter in a Sweater. That's World knit, War Two. Knitting songs from the Second World War, and another one called Knitting All the Day. So World this obviously one. this suggests an interest in you, but also a whole world of music of which I'm simply not aware. You <laughs> and everybody else, please. Glenn Miller wrote one. So one was written by Glenn Miller. It was one of the last songs he wrote before he disappeared in 1944. A um, knitting song. A knitting song. It was Knit One, Pearl Two. And I believe, and I couldn't find it when I said this, I, I did a newspaper article and I, I told them that Judy Garland sang it. I could not find the recording, but oh. I swear it's around. So I think she did sing it. She may have done it on the radio because sometimes those recordings so. come around. You know, it's an acetate recording for transcription services. Yeah. And I know like I've that. heard it, but I, I couldn't find it anyway. Yeah. So I, that was a decade ago. I couldn't find it recently. But um, so for me, the the knitting songs are how I see the styles progress because you know I mean honestly there were a lot of knitting songs in the 19th century so tell, t- tell me then please um, okay. my, what is a knitting song it's is a it song simply, about knitting and is it a song to knit to as not well Does really. it, it doesn't, so it's not the rhythm of knitting incorporated into a song or it could be but some, it isn't no some of the, some of them it's not like the songs from, from northern England or from, yeah. from northern Ivan Crofts possibly also Scotland where they would weave cloth to yeah. music no this is often the music will reflect the, the theme of the knitting needles but no it's a song it was 
In World War I, it was written to sell sheet music. I mean, there's, there's a ton of Tim Pan Alley songs. Um, the Von Tilsers wrote some. I mean, anyone, oh, right. uh, anyone yeah. who was writing popular music was writing a knitting song at that point. Well, I, supp- I mean, obviously it ties in with the, the war effort, because the one that's coming to mind is not a knitting song, but the closest proximity I can think of is uh, Sister Susie sewing socks for sailors or soldiers. Okay. Yes, um, and one of the knitting songs steals that, and because it? it's a novelty song. So, it you know, is. they try to find, there's all these musical jokes, and I don't get them all. I do get that one. <laughs> Um, but yeah, a lot of these were Tin Pan Alley or Denmark Street songs. Some of them were just some lady in a church who wrote a knitting song, and it was like very small. It was published, you know, locally. So finding them has been interesting because often a knitter will just mail me one. How interesting! Um, from their own collection, or from their own something grandma handed they, down, or yeah, or they found it in a, in a in a secondhand store in Atlanta or whatever. So, um, so would you say let's let's talk about the first album then? Okay. So these war the first World War ones, and presumably there's a little bit of history going back, as you say, they into the 19th century. Are they? Would you call them American folk? Would you because they take? I suggest I it's American what, thing. I, I have no idea. No, they're not all American. They're about half American and half British. Are they really? So it's a, it's a British yeah. tradition as well. Oh yes, during the war. Because don't forget, Denmark Street had its own yeah. group of novelty songs. I mean. Oh, yes. They were selling just as much novelty sheet music. So, um, Gertie, get on with your knitting. That is a British. That one. sounds British, if That's I may say. But the choice of Gertie, um, I think, is what carries that forward. More power to your knitting, Nell. I believe is oh. also British. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. I mean, no, they're great. They're they're great. Um, there's the knitting itch. Oh, right, okay. Which, um, that is, I'm pretty sure that's also British. I'm not sure about that one. But no, there, there are a lot of British knitting songs. Um, Canadian overseas song copyright was was established because of a knitting song in World War One called um, Knitting. Um, <laughs> well, there we go. Straight to the point. Yeah, and, but, I mean, it was, a, it was knitting all the day for the USA. But it was a Canadian yeah. song, and it became so popular in America, and no one was getting the residuals in Canada. They actually had, that's how oh. international song copyright law was established in Canada, through this knitting song. I have a lot of useless backs like that. I love this kind of so. thing. But, but, but presumably all the songs, just because it's actually a collection about, if there is a thematic collection, not a... Yeah, but, but not... Just knitting. Yeah, so the songs could be very different. So this album will feature songs which, you know, one song will feel very different to another song. So it's actually... Because the danger, you might think, is that it could be a bit samey. But actually, not what you're all. telling me is quite the reverse. No, so could, no, what's the biggest some are, surprise? Some are British, some are American, some are Canadian. There's an Australian one, there's a French one. I mean, if I had had more time and money, I would have... I mean, there's 12, maybe 14 songs on each album. I could have put 30. I have this. I have that many knitting songs. <laughs> Um, some were a little racist, so those had to stay well, off yes. because it was wartime. Indeed, so, yes. I mean, I mean that's, that's, you, that's what it's they all, did. They're products of their time. Yes. But like all things from that period, you discard the ones which are untouchable. Or those verses yeah. of the ones. But you can bring other things forward because, you know, it's still a part of history. And I, I'm just fascinated. Yep. So this is how does the Second World War album go? I mean, did you, can you spot difference in the styles of the songs? Well, yes, and this is why I brought this ge- up. Geographically? Um, <laughs> that one as well. Th- there's fewer words. There's fewer words because, again, they, people would sing them at supper clubs. They weren't to sell sheet music as much to play on the radio or to play with a big band. So there's often a band, a solo, or an orchestra solo. Um, like oh, I said, there are fewer lyrics because you didn't need to. It wasn't like a patter song as much. Some are, but you didn't need to have two clever verses and two different clever choruses. You know, it would be verse, chorus, verse, and the chorus only has a few words, most of which are knitting. But do you know, I think you've just opened my eyes to something I don't think I'd ever properly realised because the difference between the First and the Second World War, of course there were recordings in the First World War, but you know, the Second World War we think of as, you know, you'd buy a 78 of uh, Glenn Miller or whatever. Right. In the First World War it would be much rarer, there would be many fewer people who had the equipment, it would be out of the financial range of most people. So you're still relying on sheet music and singing it yourself. You know, it's the last phase of music hall in the, in the United Kingdom yes. because it's basically, it disappears the moment the radio is invented in the 20s. Exactly. So, but you're, but the thing about sheet music is that you, yeah, value for money. So you're going to write more, and also the history would be, yeah, it's going to have more verses and choruses, and you know, mm-hmm. it's going to be a longer product than a two and a half minute or three minute recording. Yeah, and, and of simpler course, chords, simpler chords. So it can be played at home. Yep. Yes, it's an amateur thing. Whereas actually, as you say, a song later on becomes more popular or gets popularity by being heard on the mm-hmm. radio and of course also it makes fame of the bands which are performing it and the singers who are performing it often with bands bands are bigger than singers I think in that period really so yes for sure well, for the often, most part well you have that lovely period don't you where you listen to the, the jazz so- songs of the 30s and 40s and actually you get the band and the band and the band and the band and then the singer comes and in then for Kate the last Kaiser bit and comes yes, in exactly. a little bit tiny bit at the end also a lot of the World War One songs were in E flat don't I oh. mean maybe it was just maybe that's an easier key to play. It's not the easiest key for me to play, but it just that ten, things tended to be an E flat. I found. 
Well, you've answered, you've answered another question oh, for me there. Well, no, and this ties into the other show, which we should at least mention. Right. Noel Coward, I believe, Eve mm-hmm. was his favourite key. Was it? I thought I that be- was Irving Berlin. Maybe it's also Noel maybe, Coward. But they're both of an era, aren't they? Because, maybe well, Irving Berlin's 1888 when he was born, and Noel Coward's 1900. So if, That's for the first, close. if the first 20 years of the 20th century are epitomised by E flat just by accident right. being a popular starting point. Yep. You know, you, you, you love the things you know as a child. That's you, a good point. I didn't right. even think of that. I, I, my first show ever was an Irving Berlin show, but um, I didn't good pay the rights for the songs and got a cease and desist order, so oh, okay. I haven't done it for a while. Well, the Berlin... Um, uh, the Foundation is very... They're yes, very... They're famous. Just, they, yes. they sued Mad Magazine Did they really? uh, in, in the 1950s, yes. And funny enough, they lost. So um, that's why in Mad Magazine and oh. other people can now parody songs. So they've also been uh, instrumental in copyright law as we're that. having a conversation about this today. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, it's, I love and Berlin look Irving Berlin's early songs are very similar to Noel Coward's early songs I mean they were both making money writing novelty songs and Irving Berlin, Berlin wrote so many every now and then God, you, I love you, them but you find them don't know it's uh, they've got punning titles or rhyming titles or something you think why well, you know why on earth would um, it's not by Irving Berlin but you know when Uber plays a rumba on the tuba is the kind of thing I would expect to have come from an early Irving Berlin you know yep. up to the end of the first world war in that sense so of course, we have travelled, but let, let's briefly talk. Actually, okay. I, I want to get back to the Anna Durbin, but actually, you've got a second show here in Edinburgh, which is Noel Coward. So it's actually been a very handy segue. Tell me yeah. a little bit about that, and how well, did you land in his lap? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I wish I had landed in his lap. He's yes. very handsome. However, um, I just really wanted a show where I could just stand at a microphone, talk about someone's life, and sing. I mean, you know, I and this show does have a slideshow, and I do it other places. So because. In Canada, people, and I, I haven't done it in America yet, but in Canada, and I'm going to be doing it in Australia, I don't don't know that people will be able to picture him as well as they can perhaps here. Oh, so he's still I, the master here. Well, this mm. is the thing, but even just like physically picture what he looks like, what he looks like at different stages in his life. So I have quite a comprehensive slideshow I've put together. Um, and I don't have that here because we have three minutes to set up the theatre. Oh, yes. <laughs> so there's I mean, also that. Yes. The, the Edinburgh requirements of yes. strike in, strike out. Yes. yes. I mean, today the amp didn't work in the show. Oh, no. Didn't, it started five minutes late and just because some wire wasn't working. And can, I can just imagine what had gone wrong had I had yeah. a slideshow I also oh, had to yes. set up. So sad. Like when I toured in the UK next year, which I, I will be touring them both probably, so then I will have I will have my slideshow. The but, fuller version, but yeah. yeah. But I just wanted to, I love his songs. I wherever I guess wherever I've been in my life over the years, one of his songs has just come along as the soundtrack to it. It just again and again from when I taught children singing in New York, and these are like rich Upper East Side children, and their parents yes. all think they're wonderful, and that's when I heard you know Mrs. Worthington for the first time, and I'm like, yes, your awful children are like that, <laughs> you know, or I travel. I travel a lot for singing and for other things. Like, I, I travel a lot, and I'm usually alone, so I spend time watching other tourists be idiots. And then I hear, you know, why do the wrong people travel? And I'm like, oh, yes. this is my life. From sail away. Exactly. So, I mean, just, it feels like wherever I am in my life, there is an Irving, or a, a Noel Coward song. That fits. That fits. Well, I think he's a great observer. I think, funny enough, that's one of the reasons he survived, because the songs... It's not always true that a comic or funny song from the 30s or 40s is still funny here in the 21st century, mm-hmm. but I think on the whole his funny songs are. He also updated them himself. You know, in the 60s when he raised, re-sang his old songs, he would change the words. He would make it relevant to what was going on now. Well, can I ask you, do you, you sing Mrs. Worthington? Do you mind I do, yes. Splendid. Now, do you go to the verse which is very rarely sung, which is the one where he actually goes apoplectic and finishes with that, that sufficed Mrs. Worthington, Christ no. Mrs. Worthington. No, but I will in the longer version. You, I just, you know, the one where I do. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, I do. Well, I just, look at her has put me in a tearing bloody rage. I think that's the most wonderful phrase. I think that's... Yeah, you know what? I will put it in the longer one, absolutely. Because, I, again, I had to cut... I've had to cut verses. To keep a show at 48 minutes and still get 12 songs in, you're, it is... You just you're doing it. I always think that last verse is a treat. I actually I accept what you're saying about having to make cuts, and it's you know it's. He doesn't uh, always sing it. No, uh, he doesn't as well because obviously it wouldn't suit the radio, and obviously if you right. want to get played on the BBC as well, you had to. There was quite a narrow line. At hard. first, he didn't care in the end. In the end, no. he just did whatever he wanted. And once he got into cabaret land, he was uh, absolutely yeah, he was on yep. his own. Um, but yeah, and also, um, but because his versions, his early rec- versions don't have it, most people who have covered him don't do it. But right. uh, but they, there was a review of his called Cow. Custard, I think, in 1973. I think it was about the time he died, wow. actually. It was that the and one he went to see on Broadway for the last... I don't it may know, well it, have been, yes. There, yeah. there was two. There was one called Cowardly Custard and another one with another name and the punning on cu- uh, cow, uh, Coward. But... Um, hmm. 
but they do sing it there. So, and that's where I came across it because oh. I heard the score of that some years ago, and I thought, what, this is Mrs. Worthington. It's got right. more Mrs. Worthington in it, right. and it's a great bit of Mrs. Worthington. If you pardon the expression, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to listen to it again because I yeah. I've heard it once, but I haven't. Yeah, I'll put, I'm gonna put it in the show. I'm Good sorry, idea. I'm gonna bore you terribly here. Have you ever heard the riposte? No. There's a song sung by Hermione Gingold, who ironically was a friend of Noel Coward, and, and, and he wrote for her, but um, was written called Tit for Tat. Can you imagine having someone write for you? That would be so nice. Oh, it's nice. so wonderful, it'd wouldn't so it? And Noel nice Coward. Stuff. Right? Yeah. He'd be like, here's a play. I wrote it in five minutes. <laughs> it's yours. Yes, it's my yours. Daughter. Have fun. It's yours. You look miraculous in the moonlight, my dear. Um, See, that's what I need men to say to me. <laughs> or women. Whatever. Someone needs to say that to me. You anyway. glow perfectly within the fluorescent light offered by the environment. That's that? what that says. That's all I need. <laughs> 21st century. Exactly. But, um, but it's called Tit for Tat. And I must say, it's not actually very funny. It's, it, but it's, it's um, about how Mrs. Worthington's daughter, who did go on the stage and actually became a bit of a hit for a brief period... And the, the joke is that Noel Coward's now bringing her plays. And she says, but you, you know, you told me I had flat feet. And oh. So it's... No, I need to find, I need to add that to the show. Absolutely. It, and it doesn't get much airplay, but it's Hermione Gingold and it's called Tit for Tat. So. No, I'm, go- I'm going to find it because again, when I tour it, it's, it's, a t- it's going to be, I haven't, I haven't toured yeah. the two act version, but it will be a two act version. I'm going to have all the time in the world. <laughs> so that'll be great. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Lovely. Wonderful. I'll, I'll come and see it. Yay. So bring us back to Deanna Durbin then. Sure. Um, how is, how how have audiences responded to it? And, and to you, if I may um, say. I mean, they, I look a little bit like her, but I mean, realistically, I don't look exactly like her. And people are very kind about yeah. that. I mean, to, to be honest, I mean... And also, well, she has 30s, 40s haircuts and things like that. I mean, yes. and I thought about getting a hair... And, but even even here, you know, my hair's a mess all the time. Oh, I mean, sure, it's, sure. it's Edinburgh. It's just, you, you wash it, it just goes poof. So, I mean, you know... At plus <laughs> I did that one day and it never came back. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... People have been lovely, and everyone has a story. This is the thing. I mean, so many people come up afterwards with stories about how, you know, they, they knew her child, or they knew oh. her, how their mother knew her, or how someone played for how their, you know, old piano teacher's mother played for her, or whatever. I mean, there's everyone seems to have a story or a piece of their history that she's attached to. And especially when I do it to older people, and again, this is mm. for the most part the generation after the generation that loved her. It's like the children whose mothers loved her for the most part now. Yeah. But um, they, it's in a way, it's giving them back a piece of their life, and it's I mean, it's giving it's giving people's, I mean, all, all of what I do, hopefully, it gives people's history a bit of it. It helps it live again. It makes it relevant, and I'm trying to give relevance to to their history, and that's. I mean, that's what I try to round do. Round and round and round the turntable goes in their life. Kind of. Yeah. It kind of, because, I mean, I think I think at a certain point, a lot of people feel um, irrelevant now. I mean, things are changing so fast in the world, and, and honestly, I don't want to be easy, like that. It's easy to get lost, it. isn't it? Yeah. But also, like, a lot of people aren't interested in looking back over the past. They're dismissing the past as the past now, and that has got to be very hard for, for people who are living in the past in a lot of ways. You Whose know? past it is. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. So, I mean, I'm hoping... Part of what I'm doing is a noble goal, hopefully. Just, oh, just, it is. Don't worry. Oh, thank you. Yes, I can I mean, tell you that. I mean, it sounds really like, here's my noble goal, but like I also like money. However, <laughs> however, you know, I'm a performer, so I need a more tangible yeah. noble goal. And it's just like to give people back their pasts a little bit and to, to and just, I feel like it's important. And also the people who who built the framework for the music and the movies and everything we're doing today, they deserve to be remembered. Oh, they absolutely do. And, uh, and the thing we forget is these are the pioneers. You know, if talking pictures only came mm-hmm. in 1926, if you were, a, you know, if you became a film star in the 30s, yeah. that's within the first decade of that kind of film. Right. And particularly in musicals, and musicals don't really sort of solidify until Busby Barclay comes along and, and arguably mm-hmm. actually Fred and Ginger, actually. So, you know, they, yeah. those first... Five years of the 30s in particular are so important to be a product of that period and then into the 30s and the later 30s and 40s. That is still the world we're living in televisually right. and people don't recognise it. So you're right. But I mean, look at someone like Eddie Cantor. He was so incredible. I mean, I love, I would love to do, if if I were a guy, I would 100% do a thing just about his life. And I might still, I might still. Um, I think you should. Yeah. I mean, I love his music. I love what he, he wrote music. He was Anyway, his, his life is another whole thing, and I'm very tempted to do to do an Eddie Cantor show. But he's making Whoopi, isn't it? Would you say that's his most famous number? He made number? a lot of Whoopi, but yes, <laughs> yes, yes quite, that yeah. is one of his songs. I'm just trying to think of a song that Ida people Sweet, might think of that they do um, know. Ida Sweet, Sweet as Apple Cider. Oh yes, is another one. Um, but that's it's got just, a good hook as well. It's that got song. a good yeah, hook. Yeah, I should say he was so 
famous. I mean, he was he was the only person they've ever made a balloon of in the Macy's Thanksgiving parade, parade oh, really? in New York. Yeah, I mean, the only actual living person. He was so incredible, and no one remembers him now. No, no he turns either. up in Bugs Bunny cartoons. Well, that's that's, that's how I first heard of Eddie Cantor. And yeah. he just no one remembers him now. I mean, for someone who was that incredibly famous for so oh. long, like for so he was the first person censored on the on the television. Oh, really? I mean, was he? Yeah. yeah, he has. There's all of these things. I think was it. It wasn't making Whoopi. It was another song, but basically, we got fun or something like that. It wasn't. It was, no, but, it wasn't but some, that, but it something was, with um, a saucy enough lyric. It was yes. saucy enough, and they told him to not to sing it. And he's like, "I'm Eddie Cantor. Like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it." And he did it. But I mean, he's again, and no one remembers him. No. And so to think that someone people think Noel Coward can't be lost. He can. Oh, a, anyone can. Laurel, Laurel and Hardy are disappearing because they don't show black and white films on television anymore. Right. You know, and they're not on that. Netflix. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a great pity. Um, you know, whatever one thinks of it, you either like or don't like Laurel and Hardy or the Marx Brothers and all these people. Mm-hmm. But unless... But, you know, you can't deny they have a place. They have a place, but also they built comedy. They, they built physical comedy. All these clowning things are so yeah. largely based on, on Chaplin things Chaplin as well, yeah. Chaplin, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Stan and Ollie. I mean, yeah. have all everybody. So. Well, I think you and I are on the same page on this. Kind of. You know? I, I, I'm very. You know, I'm not a fuddy duddy. I go into the future and I enjoy what's there, but I also want to bring the best of the past with me. And I think this show is a perfect example of oh, that. Thank you. So, um, Ingenue, which is subtitled uh, Deanna Durbin and Judy Garland and the Golden Age of Hollywood, is a magnificent show. Um, I hope that people will come and see it here in Edinburgh. I hope that people will come and see it when you take it on the road here, there and everywhere across the globe. And I hope that people will be interested enough in this conversation and your show to go off and buy A, your albums, and B, the book. Certainly the book for the Deanna Durbin the stuff. <laughs> no, but it's, you know, it really is. It's so rare an opportunity to have a chat with someone who knows what they're talking about like this. And oh, you've been you. wonderful. This but is also the same here. But to know there are footnotes. You know, I know, I now know that, you know, it's not just this episode. There's this episode and one can go off and do further research. And here's how to do it you know it's fabulous right. I mean for me what was amazing doing this research is like I said these were crumbling old like manila folders that hadn't been opened in decades no. they had clearly some reporter had just donated all of his notes and and and, and just into the like, vault they went into the vault they went and they weren't like here are some gloves be careful they didn't care they're just like here you go yeah. here you go have fun so they were just, I touched them and they would crumble. And I thought, I mm. might be the only person who, because they were crumbling. Yeah. This is why I photographed I everything. Because yes. I'm like, what they're a wise not, move, yeah. And if they ever, I mean, I can give, I'm happy to give those photos to the library. You but might also, now be the archive. I'm, this, <laughs> I, this is the thing. I'm like, my cam, the, the Google Cloud yeah, is the archive. And it just to feel that, I mean, why should I be the holder of this? You know, it just feels like oh, that's a lot of responsibility to be the holder of this kind of history. And that's another reason I wrote the book. I thought it has to be out there because what if, what if I got yeah. hit by a pigeon or a bus? Well, the papers went up in smoke. These things happen. Right. You know, you know so, archives go on fire too. Well, like, like uh, at Universal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you mentioned, yes, quite right? so much has been lost. So much has been lost. So I just, again, with the book, it felt like a bit of a race against time because what... I mean, what if, what if something yeah. happened to me? I mean, there were, there were people who had written about her life in the past. They just, she didn't want the book to be published. They died. So it's sat on the shelf. Yeah. And then it's gone. So. But Melanie, how can people find out about you? Oh. What are your socials, as the modern oh, phrase has socials. it? Okay, well, it's melaniegall.com. So M-E-L-A-N-I-E-G-A-L-L.com is my webpage. Um, music at melaniegall.com is my email. I love getting emails. So please email me. Um, I'm Melanie Presents on most of the socials because I like presents. I thought if I called it Melanie nice. Presents, someone would give me some. <laughs> I'm just like, come on. But also, um, also I present shows. So, and Melanie Gall was taken. Fair enough. By but, an earth scientist who is lovely. I have, but but, but she, doesn't sing as much. Yes. Doesn't sing as much, but she took, she took my, my social. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, but I'm around. Good, and so and you keep it up to date, so people can find out what you're doing and when not just this show, but other shows are on, and what you're doing into the future. I mean, that's the thing. It's you know, mm-hmm. I can recommend that you you put on a good show. You have a lovely voice of your own, and actually, goodness me, the research you put in. So these are good shows. So thank you very much, and thank you for thank talking you. to me. I think just this conversation alone has been absolutely fascinating, oh, well, and doesn't take anything away from the show. I, we've not revealed anything. What I mean is, mm-hmm. you know, we've had a lovely conversation which has touched on so many things, and yet, if people go to the show, they will hear the songs, they will hear, lo- learn more about the songs. And, uh, and take it from there look at the conversations I'm going to have after the second book comes out are going to be a lot weirder so don't worry <laughs> don't worry this is great Melody thank you very much and I hope to speak to you again in the future alright thank you so much musical talk
And there we are, that was Melanie Gall talking to me about Deanna Durbin and also her show, Ingenue, Deanna Durbin and Judy Garland and the Golden Age of Hollywood. And if you're interested in hearing more about Deanna Durbin, then do find a copy of Melanie's biography. And of course, there's also those albums that Melanie has collected of songs to do with knitting. I must say, when I sat down to begin the interview with Melanie, I had no idea that we were going to go off on such an interesting tangent. But it just goes to show that people are full of passion for something or the other, as we are here at Musical Talk about musical theatre and film. And if you think that ending's all a bit cosy, I might go off and knit one, a Musical Talk presenter's cosy. And obviously, whilst I'm knitting, I'll listen to some of those Melanie Gall knitting albums. Well... That'll keep me out of mischief for the next week and, of course, release you to go off and do whatever it is you want to do. But do join us here again for Musical Talk in a week's time or whenever when we'll be talking about something completely different in the amazing world of musical theatre, film, opera, pantomime or cabaret. Well, there's only one word left for me to say and after a suitably tense pause, I'm going to say it. Here goes. Goodbye. Gosh, that was tense. This episode of Musical Talk, presented and edited by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2023. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website, www.musicaltalk.co.uk or subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at Musical Talk Thos.